whether thou art a ghost that hath come from the earth, or a phantom of night that hath no home, or one that lieth dead in the desert, or a ghost unburied, or a demon, or a ghoul, whatever thou be until thou art removed, thou shalt find here no water to drink, thou shalt not stretch forth thy hand to our own, into our house enter thou not, through our fence break through thou not. We are protected, though we may be frightened. Our life you may not steal, though we may be scared to death. Welcome to a special episode of Scared to Death, Creeps, Peepers, Roberts, and Annabelles. I'm Dan. Hey, Dan. I'm Lindsay. Hello, Lindsay. Hello, New Orleans buddy. <laughs> we are, if this sounds different, it's because we're recording in a very different space. Mm-hmm. Uh, we are not recording in the studio in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho this week. We're in New Orleans. Fun, fun, fun. Mm-hmm. It's been an awesome couple of days. Mm-hmm. We're in our hotel room. Uh, the weather here has been awesome. Coming to you from just a stone's throw outside the French Quarter. Mm-hmm. All vaxxed up, uh, enjoying a short working vacation, one of our favorite cities in the world. Yes, yes. I mean, not really a vacation, really more exploratory. Yeah. Yeah, for someday, hopefully, living here. Um, part of the year is yeah. the plan. It'd be several, maybe. It'd be, maybe. It'd be many years down the road. Many years. We still have kids in school and <laughs> lots of things to take care of. But it's a, it's a dream, and it's also great to be in New Orleans, the one of the most yeah. haunted cities in the world. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're trying out a new travel recording kit put together by our producer, Joe Paisley. If you're on YouTube, recording this episode in 360 degree video. Mm-hmm. So if it all works like it's supposed to, the little red light is flashing, uh, you can explore this room we're in if you're interested. It's pretty dark in here, but there's some interesting stuff. There's some uh, black and white photo of a guy in a top hat and an al- stuffed alligator. Uh, oh, I can't see that from my angle. From my angle, mm-hmm. I see beautiful wallpaper, uh, some vintage plates, and... Producer Sophie, who we saw last night, brought us this really cool gift from a local artist, Simone. And you can't really, I mean, you can't see it from where mm-hmm. we are. And I don't want to touch it because it's not a paper bag. Yeah, It'll be yeah. super loud. But that's what I'm looking at. It's a collection of odd things. And it's all painted together with this voodoo doll kind of mm-hmm. looking thing. It's very cool. Very cool. If you're hearing this shortly after it came out, uh, last chance to get tickets to the Scared to Death live show via loops.com. Uh, Looped Live. Excuse me, dot com. Whoopsies. I know. I keep saying looped. I want to say looped. It's loopedlive.com. Last reminder for the April 22nd Scared to Death live show. Yeah, it's this Thursday. Virtual doors for 6.30 p.m. Uh, Pacific time showtime. Uh, virtual doors open at 6. Sorry. Okay. Right. So you can get in there at 6, get situated, mm-hmm. make sure your tech is working, yeah. hang out, and, and then we will be on at 6.30. Exactly. Uh, and again, for tickets, go either to loopedlive.com or badmagicmerch.com. And that will direct you to Looped for an interactive show. Perfect. Uh, If you're an Annabelle, there's a new, very cool, exclusive Annabelle Tumblr in the store at badmagicmerch.com. It is really sweet. I love it. Uh, Also, thanks to our Annabelles and Roberts for helping us donate $13,300 to the St. Bernard Project, a.k.a. the SBP, helping those in Texas, Oklahoma, here in Louisiana, who continue to work on the recovery from winter storm Uri. I know. It's so crazy. Mm -hmm. Still affecting people. You can go to sbpusa.org for more info. And then, Lindsay, uh, how many stories do you have? I have two. And they're both set in New Orleans, right? They're both set in New Orleans. One is in Pirate's Alley, for anyone who knows where that is or what that means. And then the other one, I don't want to give too much away up top, but it is a weird encounter with something, and then you find out afterwards why it seems entirely plausible that it wasn't just this person's imagination. Okay. I'm going to leave it at that. Okay. Okay. Um, I have two also both set in New Orleans. Awesome. New Orleans theme. Uh, the first is a collection of ghost sightings that have occurred over the years in one of NOLA's most famous restaurants, Brennan's in the French Quarter. Awesome. We have been there. Mm -hmm. And then, and then we're going to stay in the French Quarter and head to Jackson Square where Uh we've also been, uh, and and hear the story of its most famous executioner, Louis Congo. Okay. Who reportedly tortured and killed hundreds, uh, of people. Back 300 years ago. Wow. Does his ghost still roam the park? I mean, probably, and probably the people he killed. Um, yeah, supposedly, you know, uh, it is haunted with uh, various ghosts who some believe are people who were executed in Jackson Square or Louis Congo himself. Well, I'm very excited to talk about them as we get into each one in the recap. Okay, cool. Um, you ready for our first New Orleans story in this very first episode not recorded in Coeur d'Alene? <laughs> yes. I would like to disclaim that I do not have on fuzzy socks, but I do have on my really cute travel fuzzy slippers. <laughs> it will make too much noise to like yeah. lift them up and show, and I even have my travel fuzzy blanket. I'm ready. <laughs> perfect, perfect. 
Uh, okay, so plenty of time to uh, to settle in. Uh, this one, a little, little history lesson to, to set the stage. Great. We love a history lesson. Uh, New Orleans is a city known for a lot of different things, like ghosts. It considers itself like Savannah, Georgia, which we've also talked about, to be the most haunted city in America. The uh, city is also known for music. New Orleans is the birthplace of jazz. That 100% made in America genre of music originated in the African-American communities of New Orleans mm-hmm. in the late 19th century, born from a mix of blues and ragtime. Uh, the cornetist Buddy Bolden, generally regarded as the father of jazz, and he was leading a jazz band not far from where we sit in New Orleans back in 1895. Cool. Uh, New Orleans also known for a lot of rich history. The War of 1812 was won for America, and the Battle of New Orleans had it been lost. The U.S. could have easily ceased to exist, been taken over by Britain. New Orleans has such a unique history for an American city. It's flourished under first French rule, then Spanish, then French again for a few years, then finally American rule. And the architecture and ethnic diversity of the city still reflects its varying cultural identities over the years. Mm -hmm. And there's the food. Uh, So much good food, especially if you don't mind a little spice and a lot of seafood. Oh my God, it's been so amazing. Creole, Cajun, soul food blended together at the mouth of the Mississippi to form a culinary scene as unique as the city's music. Uh, The first documented references to gumbo come from New Orleans in 1803. The delicious crunchy po' boy sandwiches come from New Orleans. Uh, Oysters Rockefeller, Tabasco sauce, a Sazerac. Oh, yeah. Possibly America's oldest cocktail all come from New Orleans, as does Bananas Foster, a dish that brings us to our first New Orleans tale of a haunting. Okay, Bananas Foster, my dad has been making me my whole life. Well, you are going to learn about a little uh, ghost history with the Bananas Foster now. Okay. Uh, Bananas Foster was invented by Chef Paul Blanche and Ella Brennan in 1951. Chef Blanche ran a restaurant called Vu Carré, uh, Old Square in French, opened in 1946 by Ella's brother Owen Benjamin on Bourbon Street in the French Quarter. Uh, the French Quarter being the best place to take in Nola's history, music, food, and ghosts. And the ghost of the man who turned a Brennan family dessert into a nationally known dessert might still be working at Brennan's from beyond the grave, thinking he still runs the kitchen. Okay. Uh, Vu Carré uh, moved to 417 Royal Street in 1956. After Owen died and his brother, Dick Brennan, changed the family restaurant's name to Brennan's, which it still is today. Mm -hmm. And the building Brennan's moved to uh, over 60 years ago is one of the most historic buildings in the French Quarter. The pink building on Royal Street that houses Brennan's uh, constructed way back in 1795 by Vincent Rilou, uh, grandfather of renowned French impressionist, impressionist Edgar Degas. Oh, cool. Yeah, his grandfather designed that building. That is very cool. Long after Brennan's, this building once housed the Bank of Louisiana, the very first banking institution in New Orleans, uh, also once the private home of President Andrew Jackson, once operated as a brothel. Uh, The building, like New Orleans, has led a lot of different lives, seen a lot of major major changes over the years. Mm -hmm. And when Brennan's moved into this building, Blanche moved as well. And according to many, Blanche is still there today. Brennan's is one of the most famous restaurants in America, along with other famous Brennan family restaurants like Commander's Palace, uh-huh. uh, a restaurant whose kitchen famous chef Emeril Lagasse once helmed. Uh, chef Blanche worked at Brennan's running the kitchen and controlling the menu until his death at the age of 76 in 1977. Wow. And he was so dedicated to his work there, he was buried with a Brennan's menu, knife and fork across his chest. No way. He lived for running that kitchen. That is actually really impressive, Mm -hmm. really cool. Time now for the tale of the ghosts of Brennan's. Shortly following Chef Blanche's death, uh, restaurant staff began seeing him still appearing in his old kitchen. Out of the corners of their eyes, they watched his ghost appear to prepare plates. A few even began to speak to him before remembering that he was dead, turning to see him fade from view. My God. His apparition was spotted working in death just like he had for so many years of his life. And then when they turned their heads to get a better look, you know, often he would be gone. Uh, Soon after Blanche passed away, the sound of banging pots and pans soon to be heard at the end of the night, night after night, coming from both everywhere and nowhere. And staff interpreted this noise as coming from the ghost of Chef Blanche, signaling the end of the last shift of the day, like a celebration of a a good day's work. (laughs) Guests began to witness what they would later think was the chef ghost in the dining rooms and also near the front door, sometimes caught smiling at guests. Uh, A few even claimed he asked them if they'd enjoyed their meal. Does the chef not know he's dead? Like, has his love for Brennan's tied him to the building? Is there something paranormally sticky about the location, for lack of a better term, that allows his spirit to be bound there? 
because Chef Blanche does not seem to be the only eternally faithful member of the Brennan staff to be stuck inside the old building. Herman Funk was the sommelier who helped form the restaurant's extraordinary, world-renowned selection of wines and spirits. And then since his death many years ago, some think that Funk's spirit also lives on in the restaurant in the wine cellar. Some staff over the years believe his ghost helps them decide on wine suggestions and pairings. To indicate his picks, Funk's ghost will clink his preferred bottles when asked. The ghosts, of, uh, the ghosts of both Funk and Blanche seem to be beloved by the staff that believe in them. I can't find a report of either of these apparitions menacing anyone, but they are not the only spirits spotted in Brennan's, and not all of them appear to be friendly. There is also the ghost of the Red Room. The Red Room is undoubtedly the darkest and most haunted part of Brennan's. Its blood red walls once saw a day of true horror. According to 18th century legend, one fateful morning, former resident Monsieur Lafleur calmly planted three funerals. If you'd caught him right now to preparations, you would have been concerned or alarmed since no one he knew had died recently, but those deaths would come soon enough. Later that same day, Monsieur Lafleur came home, killed his wife, killed his son, then killed himself by hanging himself from the chandelier in the center of the red room. My God, why? And the room don't know. And the room he has been the site of eerie phenomena ever since. I bet. For instance, no matter the time of day or the weather conditions outside, many restaurant guests over the years have felt a cold spot over the fireplace. And this spot doesn't feel just a bit cold. It feels literally freezing, as if you've reached inside a freezer. And then there were the paintings. Prior to a massive renovation of the restaurant in 2013 and 2014, painted portraits of the Lafleurs hung on the room's walls and numerous different eyewitnesses swore that they watched the portrait of Monsieur Lafleur change its expression. According to their accounts, you could look away from the portrait one moment, then look back the next to see that he changed his demeanor. Mm -mm. The most common shift of expression was to go from a smile to a grimace. Per the account of paranormal investigator Fiona Broom, as I watched Monsieur Lafleur's face seemed to change from posed to vulnerable, or perhaps younger, and then a troubled grimace tightened his lips. It turned slightly sneering and slightly distasteful. Finally, he looked anguished or perhaps angry, even sinister. The ghost of Monsieur Lafleur has also been witnessed per broom again by at least uh, several individuals, as according to her, uh, as a shadowy figure about five and a half feet tall and somewhat portly. Staff closing up for the night have claimed to feel watched and then find this shadow figure gazing at them from near the fireplace. When spotted rather than disappear, the entity either just continues to stand there and stare or casually walks out of the room. Or in a couple of the most terrifying encounters, it's walked towards whoever has spotted it, causing them to flee from the room after they feel the temperature drop as this wraith approaches. <sighs> after the restaurant's renovations were completed in 2014, the Red Room became known as the Morphe Room in honor of chess prodigy Paul Morphe, former resident of the property, uh, Brennan's used to be his private residence, man considered to be the best chess player in the world before he was even 20 years old, around a century ago. Uh, Lafleur's portrait was replaced with a portrait of Paul Morphy. The former red room was broken up into a small parlor and dining area as opposed to the larger dining room it used to be. The fireplace and chandelier are still present. Whether or not the Morphy's rooms, uh, Morphy room's fireplace and chandelier are the same as before, though, is unclear. Were these changes made just to modernize the old room, or were they made to try and drive out the ghost of Monsieur Lafleur? If so, it didn't seem to work. His painting gone and the room he died in remodeled, Lafleur's ghost still seems to actively haunt the restaurant. Sightings of a shadow continue, and the cold still returns with it from time to time. Does his ghost still linger? Does it ever run into the ghosts of Chef Blanche and sommelier Herman Funk? What other residents of 417 Royal Street still haunt this longtime institution of the French Quarter? It was so hard to listen to that story and not just immediately think about our dinner there. So mm -hmm. we were at Commander's Palace a couple nights ago, which was our first time there. Right. Amazing meal. The right. drinks were absolutely incredible. I could yeah. have sat there and drank all night. The atmosphere is awesome. Yeah. Open kitchen that you can walk through. Sure. But I was trying to place all of that. Different places. This is Brennan's. That's Commander's. They're not the same restaurant. Oh, owned I Owned by the same people, but not oh, the same restaurant. Oh, I was in Commander's Palace the whole time. I was like, wait, what? Yep. Okay, no. Now, okay. I can think back to Brennan's. We were there years the, ago. Exactly. Okay, sorry. My bad. <laughs> Totally typical of yeah, me to be okay. in the wrong place at the wrong time. <laughs> uh, <laughs> little insight into Lindsay. Um, but okay, so that that's interesting because that uh, Brennan's is 
huge. Mm-hmm, Do you mm-hmm. remember? There's like that long hallway and like we were in a way back room. I don't remember. Oh, but, yeah. But yeah. You don't have a memory for those things the way I yeah. do. Yeah. Like I remember exactly what table we sat at and what the waiters were wearing and the table side service yeah. of the uh, Bananas Foster. And Yeah. I remember being there. I, mean, I have like vi- like little snapshots, but you know, this was before we had this podcast. So it's like it had no significance to me other than it was like a cool meal with the family. But, oh. but I wasn't thinking of like the history of it or what to look for. You set it up and you knew the history. Yeah. I was just hoping for a good meal. <laughs> yeah, like it didn't have any extra meaning attached. Now, if I went there, I'd be looking for things. Right, right, right. Well, I also think like our friends Craig and TJ owned a restaurant in Coeur d'Alene called 10 Over 6, which mm-hmm. is in hiatus right now. But they are, I think I think TJ's family is from New Orleans. And I remember right before we were coming down, she was like, okay, go here, go there. The Brennan family, Miss Ella, like she had given me some back history. Yeah. So I knew some other things. So uh, now kind of tying it all together, just the family in general. Yeah. yeah I mean, it's crazy. Mm-hmm. And I would imagine that all of their locations of all of their restaurants are haunted. Mm-hmm. And I'm imagining that our hotel room is haunted because honestly, <laughs> as you're telling the story, just being in New Orleans is like, okay, wait, what was this? What did this yeah. used to be? What could be here? What could have happened here? It's so different than being a, in a hotel in, well, even just Coeur d'Alene, where it's like, you know, the city is just not as old. It doesn't have that kind of history. I just immediately feel spooked. Well, and, and I mean, I don't know, the skeptic in me is like, how much of that is the power of suggestion too, where it's like, you can't go anywhere in the French Quarter without seeing ghost tours. There's so right. many. So you're constantly being reminded, haunted, 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 haunted. Like it's put in your face here in this neighborhood specifically more than any city in America outside of possibly Savannah. Yeah, yeah. So that, that's what I think about. It's, it's just not like top of mind, but here it just, because I find myself, I'll see I'll see a, yet another ghost tour company. I mean, mm-hmm. there, there's one on this in the same block of the hotel we're staying at. Right. I'll see people that look at their ghost uh, hunting tour gu- tour guides. Right, right. And and then it gets my imagination going, and then the shadows start to look a little spookier, and yeah. Yeah, everything feels creepier. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. A, a little bit more plausible, possible. Yeah. I'm, I'm on edge. Last night was pretty funny. I got up in the middle of the night to use the bathroom. Oh, yeah, that got me pretty good. It was pretty funny. It was also really hot in our room, so I had gone over to the thermostat to drop it down a couple degrees, and Dan didn't know I had gotten out of bed. Mm-hmm. So I came out of our bedroom, like through the little, where we are right now, like little living room, to the door, and then I was coming back, bedrooms over here, yeah. and you thought I was still in bed, and so as I came through the doorway, you just like let out a little scream, a little, not a scream, a little... <gasps> Oh yeah, 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 like, exactly. Oh god, I didn't because you didn't know it was me. Yeah, de- start definitely startled me. Huh. Mm-hmm. I, I wish like, I would have known that you was half asleep. Oh, I wish I would have been more aware because then I would have really fucking scared you. <laughs> True, you missed out a uh, chance to really get me for sure. Oh, for sure. Oh, it's an interesting history with the Brennan. Yeah, yeah. Let's open up your laptop. Okay, great. And uh, we're doing these pictures. Our whole, our whole setup here is a little different, so we're going to open up the first carousel. Okay. Uh, this is uh, on Instagram and Facebook. If you are. Um, listening. Yeah. Uh, so this first picture is just uh, Brennan's recently. So okay. Okay. Big pink, pink building. Mm-hmm. And go ahead. Oh, yeah. Uh, and then if you go down one, same building a long time ago when the chess prodigy lived there. So that's just a black and white photo, but it is pretty cool where, I mean, they didn't. It is practically the same. Yeah. They didn't change it. I mean, they they cleaned it up. Right, right. But they didn't change it, which is really cool. Which is, well, and also I th- what we learned the other day is that the Vukuri. It, it they're almost like a historical society of the French Quarter, mm. and you have to get permission to do certain things. And we were talking to Sophie the other night, and she has a friend who lives in the Quarter that I mean, it's just random. They wanted to add solar panels to their house, which makes mm-hmm. sense, New Orleans. But I, she said that she wasn't even sure if the Vukuri would allow it because they're mm-hmm. really trying to preserve the Quarter and keep it. And I get it, you know, to keep people from, especially investors, from buying, right. tearing down, chopping up into condos. Right? They're trying to maintain. What yeah, it is. It, yeah, because it would lose everything that's special about it. Right. I mean, you walk through and you you do feel like you're walking through a neighborhood that looks, you know, almost as if it did 200 years ago. Yeah. 250 years ago, minus all the cars and everything and the minus bourbon margarita Street, bottles uh, and, or margarita yeah. cups, I guess. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, the yard margaritas and the yeah. uh, beads. But yeah, this is very, very cool. And I love if you've never been to Brennan's. That when you walk through that door, it's amazing how deep that mm. property is. It mm-hmm. goes back. There's even like an out 
outdoor gardeny area. Yeah, the courtyard out back. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's a huge property. Uh, this next picture is uh, this is the red room as it looked before the 2013 2014 remodel. Okay, so okay. now the Morphe room, the pictures have been changed, but that's the Le Fleurs there on the walls. It looks and like that's the fireplace where the people would uh, get the the cold spot. The cold spot. It looks like a room where mob deals would go down. You know, it just yeah. has that very old steakhouse kind of vibe. Mm-hmm, yeah, mm-hmm. like uh, I'm trying to think of the uh, the famous director who does all the uh, the good fell not good fellas, but um, oh my God, The Godfather, Coppola. Oh, Francis Coppola, mm-hmm. Francis Ford Coppola. Mm-hmm. Like he'd see this and be like, oh, okay, I can I can use this. Right, right, right. And then this, I tried to find a picture of haunted bananas. Oh, somehow. All right, I was looking for like ghosts of uh, associated with Brennan's, and somehow like, but and then it got tied into Brennan's Foster, and it led me to banana ghosts <laughs> to find you. What? Yeah, what did I um, actually try to Google? Haunted banana. Haunted banana. Yeah, thinking about bananas, Foster led me to googling haunted banana, and then the okay. picture came up. Well, this this dessert for those of you listening and not watching, uh, yeah. it looks like they have taken shredded coconut and dyed it green, and then they've taken bananas and chopped them into various heights, giving them chocolate chip eyes and a nose. And then there is a bowl of chocolate pudding with green shredded coconut and chocolate tombstones. That's, yeah, it's pretty pretty creative. That's pretty cute. <laughs> uh, okay. You, now this next story is quite a bit darker. Okay. You ready, to, you ready to dive into it? Give it to me. Quite a bit of bloody setup on this one before we uh, turn and head into paranormal lore. So heading just three blocks away from Brennan's now to Jackson Square. Uh, to visit a much more tragic backstory and the story of a far more menacing apparition. The story and the ghost of Nola's most infamous executioner, uh, Louis Congo. In April of 1721, a a slave ship arrived at the port of New Biloxi, uh, the short-lived capital of French Louisiana. Aboard were 294 African slaves, including Louis Congo and his wife. Louisiana at the time had recently received a massive influx of French outcasts, mainly indentured servants and convicted criminals, Indian slaves abducted from local tribes, also new to the city. African slaves had just uh, began arriving two years earlier in 1719. And as the population quickly grew, settlers struggled with constant food shortages. Many soon died from starvation and disease. France and Spain were battling for control of the area, deserting soldiers also moving in amongst the uh, already struggling population to further add to the disorder. French Louisiana was immersed in the beginning of a long era of chaos and violence, a lot of crime. Louis Congo and his wife were two of many forced into this uncertain world. Rather than being sold to individual slave owners, Louis Congo and his wife were both kept as the property of the Company of the Indies, a company that held a business monopoly in North American French colonies, and at this time, a company that was also the governing body of French Louisiana. The pair were both enslaved in New Orleans, but not allowed to live with one another. Congo loved his wife madly, and the two longed for each other deeply. Then soon, a dark offer was made to him to allow him to live with her once more. While Louisiana and the rest of the South would eventually adopt a model of racially-based slavery primarily based in plantations, at this time, not all Africans were enslaved, and not all whites were free in New Orleans. The French Code Noir, uh, a.k.a. the Black Code, adopted in 1685, included articles protecting the rights of free slaves, rights that were more or less the same as whites. I say more or less because no one's legal rights were very clear-cut at this time. A colonist would complain in a letter written in 1723, speaking of the colony, In short, this is a country which, to the shame of France, be it said, is without religion, without justice, without discipline, and without police. So very anarchistic or anarchist at this time. Uh-huh. Uh, crime plagued New Orleans shortly after Louis Congo arrived, and soon the Superior Council, the first governing body of the city created by the French King Louis XIV in 1712, would look to Louis Congo to help bring order to their new city. Congo was a strong man, feared by his fellow slaves, and he had a shrewd mind respected by the men who'd enslaved him. The council viewed him as just the man they'd like to do their dirty work for them. They wanted Congo to be their executioner who would unquestionably carry out the decrees of the council. Interestingly, for the time, Congo, should he accept this position, would be carrying out the tortures and murders of not just fellow Africans, but also of white settlers. In 1725, the the council made their unusual bargain with Congo. In exchange for him torturing and killing anyone they chose to punish, he would not only be given his freedom, but also have his wife returned to him. He would be given a full monthly ration of wine and drinks, a parcel of land on the outskirts of New Orleans, and be paid for his punishments. Flogging someone would earn him 10 pounds. Hanging was worth 30 pounds. My God. He was compensated 40 pounds for breaking someone on the wheel or burning someone alive. 
Congo's name quickly spread throughout French Louisiana because of his unique position as a former slave turned executioner and because of the amount of brutal executions he supposedly carried out. Uh, Rumored to have killed hundreds of men, he did whatever the council decreed and seemed to enjoy his work. He set men on fire, he beat men to death, he whipped, flogged, mutilated men, hanged men, and Jackson Square was where he would carry out the overwhelming majority of these punishments. From 1725 until 1737 in some sources, all the way until 1762 in others, Louis had the sole authority to carry out whippings, hangings, and worse to residents of all races in Jackson Square. If you were caught stealing, Congo might have you branded with a a fleur-de-lis. If you were a slave and caught running away, you might have your hamstring sliced, be maimed and crippled for the rest of your life. If you were sentenced to death by the council, Congo might hang you, or worse, you could be put on the wheel and broken. The wheel was a massive Lazy Susan-type device where victims were strapped down face up and then Congo would spin you, also beat you with a large mallet called a cudgel. Round and round you'd go, Congo breaking your arms, hands, feet, legs, pulverizing you. My God. Making sure you didn't die too quickly, sparing your head from any finishing blows so you suffered as much as possible. Congo dished out violence, also endured a fair amount of violence himself for uh, being the executioner. His job made him a lot of enemies. I bet. Just a year after his appointment, three fugitive American Indian slaves entered his home, brutally attacked him one night. A short time later, two African slaves ambushed him in broad daylight as he was hunting, nearly beat him to death. The second incident was thought to be retribution for a sentence Congo carried out on a slave named Guala, whose ears he had cut off for chronic marooning, which was repeated attempts to escape. To keep their executioner safe, the council made attacking him a crime punishable by death and let him, of course, carry out executions on his attackers. This is insane. An Indian slave named Bontemps, suspected in that first attack on Congo, was made an example of. Congo carried out Bontemps' sentence uh, on a late spring morning. He brought the man to the hanging scaffold in what is now known as Jackson Square, what was then known as Place d'Armes, French for Weapon Square. Uh, A small crowd circled the wooden stage. Congo guided Bontemps up a ladder, draped a rope around his neck. Then he made sure his attacker did not die a quick and painless death. Instead, Congo pushed Bontemps from the ladder before he could reach a height that would break his neck. Oh, God. Then watched him as he struggled to breathe. For a full 10 minutes, (gasps) Bontemps pulled, clawed at the rope. Apparently, his hands were not bound. Uh, Tried to get it free around his neck, struggling to writhe free. Finally, his body went limp, and then a dark purple hue washed across his skin. Then his body was not cut down. He was left dangling for days to serve as a warning and to intimidate uh, anybody else who might plan a retaliation. Then, sometime after 1737, Louis Congo faded into historical obscurity. No one seemed sure of when he died, what happened to him. Uh, At some point, obviously, he passed on. He couldn't be the executioner forever. And then not long after that, rumors of his ghost sightings began to spread around the city. Time now for the tale of the executioner's ghost. It's said that Congo's ghost appears only at night and only in Jackson Square as a hooded, shadowy figure who can smell your sins a figure who then seeks to punish you for your transgressions. And several years ago, after a long night on Bourbon Street, a young man named Mark found himself wandering inside this park alone, sometime an hour or two before sunrise. One of the few hours when you could find yourself alone in this incredibly popular park uh, at the time. Uh, Sorry, more on that at the end of the story. Because if you're from New Orleans, you're like, how did he get in there? Well, that'll be part of the story. The two friends he'd come to town with had left with some women they'd met that night. One of them had the key to the room they'd all rented together, a room not under Mark's name, and neither one of his friends were answering their phones. Mark left the last of many bars he'd been to around 4 a.m., tired (laughs) tired and drunk. He wandered around aimlessly after first trying and failing to get a new key to his room from the front desk and failing to contact his friends. He left some drunken texts, hoped they'd see them and respond before he had to wait too much longer. When he finally made it to Jackson Square, he sat down on a park bench facing Andrew Jackson's sculpture, and he had uh, just started to doze off when he saw him. He saw a man, or at least he at first thought it was a man, walking towards him from the center of the square. At first he thought this man was just another wanderer like himself, looking for a place to crash for the last hours of the night. He kept his eyes half open and watched him, waiting to make sure he was heading to a bench other than his own. Even in his exhausted, drunken state, he was aware that Nola had one of the higher crime rates in the nation. Even though he was a young guy and a bigger dude, he still knew he wasn't fully exempt from the possibility of a mugging or worse. As he watched the man get closer, 
the first alarm bells went off inside his head. How dark was it? How drunk was he? As the guy got closer, his features didn't seem to grow more defined. He was too dark. And was he wearing a hood? And why did he seem to be walking straight towards him? Mark, who'd slumped down and brought his feet up and was curled up and resting on his side, now sat up to let this guy, who couldn't be more than 50 feet away now, know he was not asleep. And the dark man didn't slow or break his stride. He he continued to walk with purpose straight towards him. More alarm bells now, really ringing. What's going on, man? Mark called out, doing his best to appear a hell of a lot more calm than he felt. The dark man again did not slow or break his stride. He was only about 30 feet away now. Mark now stood up and tried his best to sound as tough as he could. He reached around to the back of his waist and said, What the fuck are you doing, man? If I have to pull my gun on you, I swear to God, I will not hesitate to pull the trigger. The man was only about 15 feet away now. And the way the park lights hit him, he didn't have a face. He didn't have features. Just the shadowy shape of a short, muscular man wearing what seemed to be a hood who was almost now upon him. Fear filled Mark, who did not have a gun on him. Too scared to even yell, he turned and tried to run, and he didn't make it more than two or three steps before he stumbled and fell to the ground. Without turning around, he knew that thing was still coming for him, and he started to crawl forward, unsuccessfully scrambling to his feet when he felt searing pain shoot across his back as he screamed out. Jesus Christ, he thought. Had he just been whipped? The pain seemed to instantly sober him up, but he managed to get to his feet. He started to run and then felt a new pain shoot across the back of his leg that made the whip feel like nothing more than a gentle warning. He fell to the ground and grabbed his leg and felt blood flowing out of a giant tear in his jeans. He'd been cut deeply. The back of his leg had been slashed and now his leg didn't work right. Oh my God. His hamstring tendon had been severed. He writhed and rolled over onto his back and saw the shadow man now standing above him. The shadow swung down with some kind of club towards his face and he threw his hands up to block it. Fresh white hot pain now shot out from his wrist. His hand now stuck out from his arm at an unnatural angle. His wrist was shattered. The club swung down again and broke his other forearm. Jesus. The third time it swung down, his mangled arms only barely cushioned the vicious blow before the club crashed into his skull and stunned him. Dazed and in shock, he lost consciousness for a moment and then woke up feeling like his hair was on fire. He was being dragged. He screamed as the shadow pulled him by his hair towards the center of the square. The thing that pulled him was so strong, impossibly strong. He now felt certain he was going to die. Soon, he was being pulled up some steps and placed on a wooden platform. (gasps) What was happening? He was being tied down. He was being spun around in a circle. As he twirled around, he saw the shadowy man above him for a moment and then kept spinning past him. When he spun back around, the man was there again, and this time he swung his club into the leg that hadn't been slashed, and he felt his kneecap explode. Then around he went again. He screamed as he spun around, and this time the club came down against his mouth. His front teeth, nose, and jaw shattered. Blood poured into his throat, and it was hard to breathe. What was happening? Why was no one helping him? The next time he came around, the club hit him right in the left eye, caving in the socket. He just wanted to die now, his entire body screaming in pain. He barely hung to consciousness. He was drowning in his own own blood, but he wasn't dead. Again and again, the club came down on his stomach, his groin, his ribs. Then finally, after what felt like an eternity, with an especially swift blow to his head, it was lights out. And then it was lights back on. Sunlight. Mark woke up on the park bench in the square he'd fallen asleep on, and it was a new day and his body was unbroken. What? Strangely, his pants were torn on the back of one of his legs and his body ached all over. Partially from a hangover, sure, but he had a lot of those and this was far worse than any of them. Partially from sleeping on a park bench, yes, but this wasn't just that either, this was something else. What was that dream? He checked his phone and his friends had tried to call him and texted him back. They'd made it back to the hotel room. Mark headed there as well. And he had to climb over the iron fence that surrounds the park to get out, which wasn't easy. He couldn't walk out the gate because the gate was still locked. It should have been locked when he came into the park the night before, yet he had no memory of ever climbing over anything, ever walking through a gate. No memory of seeing this fence. So strange. Mark went back and crashed in his room, hoping he wouldn't fall into another intense nightmare. But is that what actually happened? It didn't feel like it had just been a dream. Later that day when he woke up, he looked into the Jackson Square legends, uh, hauntings there, and that's when he came across the story of Louis Congo, the infamous Jackson Square executioner. He read stories of Congo whipping men, slicing their hamstrings, beating, breaking them on the wheel. How could he have had such a specific nightmare involving an executioner who'd lived three centuries earlier, a man he had never heard of? 
He wondered if maybe he'd heard stories about Congo out at the bars that night before, but he doubted it. 18th century torture isn't exactly normal 3 a.m. Bourbon Street bar conversation. He told his friends they hadn't heard of him either. Had he actually seen the shadow of Louis Congo that night? Had this ghost somehow let him into the park? Had he been psychically tortured by the old executioner? He'll never know for sure, but he'll forever believe that whatever happened to him that night in Jackson Park was a lot more than just a drunken nightmare. That's insane. Mm -hmm. Insane. Just just a a different thing where, mm, I like this one where you can talk about like, uh, oh, like with sleep paralysis and and things that can just be like your mind. Right, right. And just that possibility of, it almost kind of reminds me of like uh, Freddy Krueger, except that you would actually die in, in the dream and then you die in real life. But that possibility of, what if something could uh, just get into your mind? Right. Like change. I mean, obviously there is a possibility if this is story is real, that he changed some physical things and a lot, because you can't just go into the park. It's locked up at night. There's like a fence that surrounds it in the gate. You can't just wander in there. That, that's, so that's really insane. I was going to ask you about that. So if this is true, it's like did this thing kind of bend physical stuff to make like. To, to allow him like maybe just some opening in the gate or right, remove the lock. Right, to allow him in there. Or just, mm-hmm, and then just like get into his mind. And then there's the weird stuff of like, again, if it's all true, if his genes are tore. I know that's kind of what really sent me. Mm-hmm, you could say I mean, like, I well, he could, could have happen. hurt himself out in the street being drunken right. and, you know, falling down or whatever. There's a lot of ways. Or if you did crawl over the fence, and you just blacked out and forgot. I mean, oh, that's a really, <laughs> I, hmm, I, I don't know that I've ever actually been blackout drunk. I've been blackout drunk. I mean, when I was younger, but like so many times. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I only had one. It's like a really tragic story, so like let's not yeah, talk yeah, about yeah, like sure, being, sure, sure. you know, totally unaware of what's happening. But yeah. I've never drank that much, mostly yeah. because I get to a point where I just start throwing up. I, I can't drink to a point of just passing out. Right, that's not how my body chemistry yeah, it's, works. It's different, yeah, yeah, different bodies. I mean, unfortunately, like my body, like when I would drink that much when I was younger, um, it it just it would just keep going past the point where it's like I just wouldn't throw up. I would just be able to keep drinking, which is not a good thing. No. And then, oh yeah, like, I mean, (laughs) we would, I mean, so stupid. We were just like uh, such binge drinkers back then, but we would just joke about like trying to reconstruct our nights. Oh boy. And yeah, and just like find out that you had lost like a solid three hours. Oh boy. My brother was a blackout drinker. Mm, It's a weird thing. It is a weird thing because he would come, (laughs) he would come home and I would find him the way that our house was. It was Mm -hmm. this uh, ranch on a basement. Mm-hmm. If you know that style of house. And so when you came in the back door, immediately to the left was a half bathroom. Uh-huh. And so many times, so many times, I found my brother in there, passed out. I would hear him throwing up. You know, I would go in there. My mom, like, you know, I mean, we were sure. young and stupid or whatever. But uh, the next day you'd ask him and he wouldn't even remember throwing mm-hmm. up. None of it. He had none of it. Yeah, it's a, it's a real thing. I, mean, I think some people who they don't experience that, they're like, come on. No, like, like because they, I've like, watched they, it. Yeah, I know. It's very valid. They think that you're just trying to get out of like responsibility for maybe what you did. And it's yeah. like, no, I legitimately have no idea like what <laughs> happened between one and four. I wish I, I'm going to have to call my mom after this episode because there was one time that Jason came home and he was, he, I mean, he was so violently ill. Mm-hmm. And I remember asking him like what my mom was worried that maybe he had food poisoning on top mm. of it or that there was something else going on that maybe he had gotten fucked up on some drugs or I don't right. you know she was worried and I cannot remember did he say he was I want to say he was having something called a bartender's revenge <laughs> and it had something to do because I think he kept saying revenge revenge yeah. like we were freaked out I want to say it had something to do with a drink that they would light on fire and um catch the smoke and then you would inhale the smoke and then do a oh shot like whatever it was it yeah. was fucking awful <laughs> um but yeah a really fascinating story and i was thinking back to the first time we were in new orleans we had the kids with us mm-hmm. and we went to jackson square very late it was the last thing we did of the day i i it's wanted like to get Dumont. yeah it was right after we went to cafe Dumont, and i wanted to do the horse and buggy like the carriage oh, yeah. tour mm-hmm. and it was so funny we walk up to this guy who's, you know, in his carriage. Yeah. And I was like, hey, you asked him, you said like, hey, uh, you know, is it too late? Because right. you know, they were it was, clearly- It was like 10 minutes from when they were supposed to be done. Yeah, and he goes, is your name Dan? <laughs> right. And then he realized who you were and it turns out he was a big fan and he did this awesome- Yeah, it was a really cool It was a tour. really cool tour, but I remember being spooked on that. Oh, you know, yeah. It was late at night, it was dark, and yes, there were people out, but- Right was, behind those horses is that fence that surrounds the park. Yeah, oh, yeah. I mean, I can picture exactly mm-hmm. what you're talking about. So if you've ever been down here, it's just, oh, mm-hmm. wow. Yeah, I was really relating to that story. It's pretty crazy. And mm-hmm. also, I'd never heard of the wheel before this story. 
Yeah, and a lot of people, you know, it's it's funny. Like the, I don't know if this particular story is too dark or something. Not, I don't know. But what's interesting is like the story of Louis Congo. Yeah, it, it really doesn't seem to be uh, common lore around here. I mean, once you start to look in, you can find plenty of legit articles. Right. But it's not. It's the they're not commonly searched for. The ghost tours around here, I don't think, really share this story. I mean, there's um, Pirates Alley. There's other things, right. you know, like that that will come up. But it's interesting to me that I'm like, oh, this is a fascinating little portion of history, right? That doesn't really get talked about. Well, it's very, like you said, it's very brutal. It's very mm-hmm. dark. Um, yeah. You know, I think that we're living in this time where we're not trying to rewrite history, forget history, but we are trying to. Some people are trying to forget history, and yeah. I'm not. Right. But yeah. I think I think some people are trying to elevate, you know, mm. and talk about these horrible things in a different way. Instead of making it something, this isn't a, like, listen, I'm not going to go on like a PC <laughs> police tangent kind sure, of thing. Sure. But I think that we're trying to find ways of talking about horrible things like this without mm. it being like juicy gossip, right? Mm. So there might be this decision sort of amongst the ghost tour people, right? <laughs> of like, okay, listen, let's not highlight this person. Huh, yeah, maybe. You know, some sort of unspoken agreement. I could be way the fuck off, okay? <laughs> so, I just try to like find the good in everyone. So here is um, a few pictures here. This first one uh, is just Jackson Square at night. And it it's is so, so pretty. It is so, so pretty. So I mean, pretty. it's beautiful. I mean, they did one, what, what Ryan Seacrest did, one of the New Year's Eve things uh, from Jackson Square a couple years ago. He did? So, yeah, several years ago. I mean, it's Why? Like they, uh, that's, I don't, that's, I don't that's know that's why they choice. went to New Orleans instead of um, New, New York, York City, but it is such a, it's a really, really cool place. Like really Was it cool. maybe after Katrina, maybe like a fundraiser or something? I can't remember the year. I just remember seeing that and be like, oh, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. And then here's an old sketch of somebody being broken on the wheel. Oh, right? I see. See that Lazy Susan kind of reference where yes. they're like face up and they get spun around and then yeah, that guy has a big ass stick to whack them? Yeah, I wasn't thinking about them being laid out execution style mm-hmm. first. I was thinking more like the guy in the upper left. Yes. On that wheel. I'm sure they had a different variety of wheels. Yeah, that, no, you know, sure. Yeah, d- well, in case styles. one breaks, you got to be prepared with something else. Uh, medieval torture, whenever, which is. <sighs> It always reminds me that when people um, try and say that like we're the most macabre, the most obsessed no. with crime we've ever been, oh, no, we are not. No, I think, in fact, we're relatively evolved and mm-hmm. t- I think turn away. Yes, okay, there's a certain element of like, oh my God, what's happening? But also we look away a lot more now. Yeah, it, it's just We're funny. not going to like a fucking square to watch someone be executed. Oh yeah, and when, when uh, you know, polite society, quote unquote, you know, it, it was more prevalent like in the 1920s. And yeah. 1920s, um, it was it was a whole thing where if um, like a bit like there was a story of like a big murder and a bunch of bodies were found somewhere, uh, people would travel from all around to try to get pieces of the crime scene, and they would like have picnics. They would bring their families. So fucking weird. <laughs> they would get pictures, but like it's, it's a really weird piece of history. But it's, it was a whole thing where like people, it was like a, a thing to do. It's mm-hmm. like hop on the train. Oh my god, there was these this family of six was murdered two hours away. Let's get there. And uh, try and sneak, you know, uh, you know, sites of the bodies. Ah. Or, I mean, I mean, real dark would actually right. go to the crime scene. So when when people talk about now with all the true crime podcasts and everything, like, oh my god, we're so obsessed with murder. We have always been, mm. and it makes me think with this sketch of the breaking the wheel. They didn't just uh, when Louis Congo was doing these things. He wasn't like it wasn't just him and the person. Right, there was a huge crowd of people cheering and watching and kids. Ah, uh, so weird. Whole other, that's a whole other can of worms. Now, this last uh, photo that I thought was funny. (laughs) I was trying to find a picture of somebody just drunk on Bourbon Street, and randomly, some guy who lives near Bourbon Street trained his dog to pretend to pass out. That is really funny. And he dresses him up in little, like, with beads and stuff, and the dog just, like, lays there surrounded by drunk paraphernalia. And, like, fake vomit? Mm hmm. Fake vomit. Mm -hmm. He's got a little sticky thing of fake vomit he puts by the dog's head. Okay. That dog's little smile is hysterical. (laughs) I was just thinking about Penny and Ginger. Mm hmm. That is really funny. Uh, and that is all I've got. Yeah, that was a that was a great a little history lesson. Very spooky. Yeah, I mean, again, like you were saying, I mean, everywhere you go, New Orleans could be or may, might supposedly be haunted. But mm-hmm. I'm excited to go get some beignets after this, which is our plan because mm-hmm. we're going to walk right through Jackson Square. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, very good, very good stories, Dan. I had a lot of fun. Learning a little history of New Orleans good, and good. places we've been. And yeah, it's a, a nice way to tie it all together. I, I will say I've gotten, uh, you know, doing this long enough now, you know, just natural to get a little jaded. Oh, of course. Uh, or become more of like a connoisseur of horror stories. Right. And I did think it was pretty funny where I, I, I had to look way longer than I thought I was going to have to look 
to find uh, good horror stories from New Orleans. Interesting. I find that a lot of these cities with all these like, you know, so many ghost tours and so many haunted tales. Yeah. It's like the briefest little quick hits on various buildings. It's like somebody was murdered in this building and now sometimes someone hears a noise. Right. And I'm like, but then what? <clears throat> oh, no, that's it. That, <laughs> I, but interestingly enough, that yeah. somehow carries more weight with me. Mm, I be- see. Because- you know, I mean, listen, we're always operating, excuse me, we're always operating on this, if if just one thing is true, if sure, just one thing, sure. if just one thing. That's true. So just a small thing. Yeah, because there's lots of those. Yeah, yeah. And actually, I didn't include this one story that I was going through the fan stories. I'm hoping that we'll be back in New Orleans and we'll get to do this yeah. again in real time. But um, <clears throat> I'm so sorry. I, uh, sorry, Lindsay. Lindsay uh, I chugged some water yeah. and it, it attacked my throat, <laughs> which is also like Dan is just laughing at me mm-hmm. because it is so me. Lindsay's a hot mess. Oh. <laughs> hmm. Not always. Uh, listen. You're, you, you have, you're an interesting mix that way. You're a very organized person, yeah. but also super clumsy. Yeah. And things. So it's like you'll you'll do everything. Like you'll set a checklist. You'll do this. And then when everything's perfectly ready to go, you'll like fall over and knock something <laughs> all over everything you've just set aside. Like, yeah. That is you, so true. Yeah, just the both. But it's, it's become a thing now where like when I do something that's very normal, like swallow wrong, Dan mm-hmm. just looks at me as like, of course you would. It's like, I'm not, there's become this weird space now where it's like, I'm. it's not that I'm not allowed, but sure. it often feels like if I just do something that most people do, Dan's right. immediately like, Oh of boy. course you would. It's like, well, yeah, so would fucking you. That's true. It's not That's like true. you've never uh, drank water and then choked and coughed for five minutes because it went down the wrong pipe. True. I, I got to reframe you. Uh, it, but but the checklist and the falling down feels a bit more <laughs> accurate. Um, but yeah, what I was going to say is that, you know, there, I, I think I would be, I don't know. I was thinking about if we lived in a house, let's just think specifically in New Orleans, and I didn't know, well, of course I would ask if, there was any history, but let's yeah. just say there was no reporting of anything ever happening. And then one day I'm standing in the kitchen and I feel a cold gush come by me. Uh-huh. That is almost more terrifying than it happening every day as something, something, something. Cause I think eventually then you're like, okay, yep. Mm-hmm. But mm, these little fleeting glances of yeah, something. Yeah. Just like a, a one-off is almost like, wait, did I? Huh. Was that my imagination? Yeah. Because when you can constantly not recreate it, but experience it over and over, right? It's like anything. Like you were saying, you become jaded. It's like you just get used to that being part of it. If especially yeah. if it's not something aggressive that you're afraid of, it's just a cold spot. Yeah. Right. Then you're like, oh, okay, yeah, yep, definitely a cold spot. Yeah, that makes yeah, sense. I don't mm-hmm. know. Mm-hmm. Okay. No, I, I see what you're saying. Okay. Well, I have been so excited for this episode. It's been so fun to dig through fan stories yeah. and and find the New Orleans stories. I knew we would have them from our fans. So you said you found several, right? You didn't get to pick I from did. Them. I did. I had quite a few to pick through. So if you have written in a story, uh, shared a story that's from New Orleans and you don't hear it today, fear not. That mm-hmm. doesn't mean that we'll never use it. I just am really trying to hold on to them, knowing that this is one of our favorite cities to visit. Yeah. And, you know, we're. Our, our dream is to live here and all, you know, you guys know that. So, uh, yeah, wrote, I even wrote this episode in New Orleans, which is super fun. Um, okay. Now this story <laughs> actually not far from Jackson square. Okay. And it's definitely creepy, but also the author of the story is fucking hilarious. So there's, um, definite laugh out loud moments, but definite like, what the hell? So, uh, it's a good combo, a little warm up here. Okay. Now this happened a few years ago in 2015, I was doing an armed security detail in downtown New Orleans overnight. As you can imagine, it wasn't the most ideal working conditions, but it definitely had its perks. My area covered from the Moonwalk to Decatur. The Moonwalk is connected to the more popular River Walk. It runs alongside the Mississippi River and parallel to Jackson Square. One night in August, it was hotter than the devil. <laughs> It was hotter than the devil's nutsack, and I was taking one of my breaks down at Café du Monde when Uh this guy walked in. He seemed kind of off, but not in your typical drunk guy in the middle of the night, off, just off. He was walking with this limp, and he kept his head down for the most part. He was wearing a fedora and what looked like an old suit, which honestly is normal attire for downtown, but like I said, (laughs) this guy just seemed off. He sat down at a table maybe 20 feet away from me, He smelled awful, like a mix of sweat, and I know this sounds weird, onions. The waitress went up to him and offered to take his order, but he just kept his head down and never even responded to her. Nevertheless, she was kind and brought him a glass of water and left him. 
I sat there for another 30 minutes or so, scrolling through Facebook, passing the time, and trying not to suffocate in the humidity. I left the cafe and continued my route. I was talking to a shop owner on the side of Jackson Square when the guy from the cafe walked by. The shop owner, who we'll call Bo, made a comment about the onion man. He said he walks the square every night. Weird. He never talks. He never lifts his head, but he's always whistling the same song. There are countless homeless people in the square at night. Hell, even during the day, they're all over. So I didn't think too much of it. Plus, I was armed. So if some whistling, limping weirdo wanted to square up, I was ready. Onion guy passed us, and we both held our shirts over our faces to block out the smell. He walked by and was whistling, you are my sunshine. I didn't see him for the remainder of the night. Two nights later, I was back on the moonwalk doing my patrol. I was walking past some stairs that led from the walk down to the river. As I was passing them, I smelled it again, that onion smell. Sure enough, I looked down at the bottom of the stairs and he was there. Same suit, same hat, and whistling, you are my sunshine. I kept walking, talking to myself like, come on, Kim, he's just a bum, shake it off. But like I said, there was something about him that I couldn't ignore. No more than maybe three minutes later, I smelled the onions again. I turned around and there he was, right behind me, so close that if I stopped walking, he would have bumped into me, limping his limp, dragging his foot, head down. I turned around and asked him if I could assist him in any way. I offered him a bottle bottle of water, but he never spoke and never looked up. He raised his hand in the air like he was about to high-five me, but then made a come here motion and started whistling that same fucking song, You Are My Sunshine. I looked around to see if maybe he was motioning for someone else, but there was no one else around, just us. I asked him again if I could help him, and he stopped whistling slowly and lifted his head. All I could see was his busted up smile with most of his teeth missing. He reminded me of the old man in the poltergeist. So goddamn creepy. He finally spoke and I could have sworn he said the word skin. I asked him again, sir, can I help you? You're walking pretty close to me, you know. And then he said it again, skin. I had goosebumps all over. Skin, I repeated back to him. He smiled again, never revealing his eyes, and began began laughing maniacally, almost like the Joker. I am no Darren. I put my hand on my pistol, got on my radio, and called for my partner to come to my location. The onion guy eventually stopped laughing, started whistling again, and walked away. I was so confused. Like, what in the actual fuck was that? Mm -hmm. My partner got to me, and I told him everything that had happened. He reassured me it was just some drunk bum and that I should walk it off. And I did. I ignored my inner bitch and spent the rest of the night like normal. The night, the next night, a coworker called off sick, so my detail was changed to Charity Hospital. I was pretty excited about this detail because I was born at Charity. It had been abandoned for years, and although House on Haunted Hill had pretty much ruined hospitals for me, I was looking forward to this. One of the first areas to patrol was the basement. It was your normal basement with generators and pipes, abandoned evaluator shafts, evaluator, abandoned elevator shafts, and stuff (laughs) like that. Everything was going fine until I got to the third floor. It smelled awful up there. And yep, you guessed it, just like onions. I was like, fuck this shit. I headed to the stairwell, but the door was jammed. I turned around using my flashlight as my only source of light, and there he was, behind an old counter at a nurse's station. The onion guy was standing there, tapping his foot. He started walking, dragging that fucking foot, but not towards me. He was going away from me. I was like, okay, Kim, let's get your shit together. You're 25, alone, in an abandoned hospital, smack dab in the middle of New Orleans. What's your next move? I did what everyone would do. I called my mom. I called her and she called 911. He was out of the range of my light, but I could still hear his foot dragging. And then the whistling came. You are my sunshine. At that point, I was done. I screamed at him, Sir, you cannot fucking be in here, sir. Get the fuck out of this building. I've already called the authorities. The whistling stopped abruptly, and the walking and the dragging of the foot turned into running. It was no longer going away from me, but now coming towards me. I screamed into the phone, telling my mom, He's gonna kill me! I put my phone in my pocket and ran like hell. I turned back and fired two shots, but it didn't phase him. He was getting closer and closer and the smell of onions was overwhelming. He was screeching, not screaming, but screeching the word skin. 
He wanted my skin? What the fuck was he? And how the fuck was he running with that limpy ass foot? I made it back to the stairwell again and it opened. Thank Forrest Gump and his disciples, the door opened. I made it down to the first story stairs, but he was impossibly still behind me screeching skin. I walked through the door, ran past the receptionist's desk, and then I heard it. You are my sunshine. He was whistling, limping, slowly. What in the actual fuck was happening? Nevertheless, I kept running. The cops met me a few blocks down and I explained everything. They went into the hospital and searched the entire building, but never found a trace of that guy. Needless to say, that was my last night on the job. I'll never hear that song the same way, and I hate the smell of onions. I know you all say a lot of these stories can be fake, but even if one is real, that's enough. And I assure you, this one is real. Kim. Kim. Wow. I I just was like, oh, God, what a, like, what a fucking weird situation. Mm Mm-hmm. Made me think like my brain went to like, you know, like a horror movie kind of land of, of like how this would look in a movie. Yeah, but yeah. It just made me think about like, okay, if there's a, a large homeless population and kind of like regulars, eccentric, you know, I'm sure a lot of like mentally ill, like around Jackson Square, sure. maybe think of like Skid Row in LA. Mm-hmm. And then it just made me think how easy it would be for something oh. to sneak in amongst that group where a lot of people are struggling. People don't take them seriously right. because they have mental illness. <gasps> it's a transient population where people come and go that if you were some – monster some th- how Entities easily and demon yes. how easily you could blend in and just live amongst kind of the, you know that group of people okay i literally did not consider that that's yeah. that actually is a great premise for a horror movie mm-hmm. because you're right i mean we don't know the rules of the other side so they can come over they can be shapeshifters they can take on different forms yeah, that's what's fun about the paranormal is once you go into this space uh, it's not just, you know, the possibility of ghosts. It's the possibility of, possibility of anything that hasn't been proven by science. Right. Which is everything else, you know? Right, <laughs> there's science and then everything, everything else. Everything else. And so, if, yeah, if you let your imagination go, it's like, well, right. if it could be this, then it could be that, and it could be this other, and it could be anything at all. There's no rules. Yeah. But yeah, that's, uh, yeah, that would obviously terrify me as well. I'm not surprised Kim got really freaked out. I mean, oh, yeah, who, he's funny. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I love that. I love, like his limpy ass foot. Now, was that a he Kim, Kim he, or Kim she? Well, I think that Kim is male because of the reference of it. It was hotter than the devil's nutsack. Oh, funny! That just immediately like I just I was picturing a, a she Kim that entire time, but it could be either. Yeah. It could be. It could be either. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To be determined. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm sure that Kim can let us know. Um, yeah, I just I don't know. I just thought it was the nutsack because <laughs> I feel like a woman would have said like I had like swampy ass. I don't know. It just <laughs> whatever. Huh. Assumptions. Yeah, okay. interesting, interesting. Let us know, Kim. Maybe Kim is non-conforming. That is sure. also like a very good name if you mm-hmm. are up in the air. It's versatile. Versatile, exactly. Um, okay, do you have it in you to hear one more? I do. Okay, now I this- I these are all set in New Orleans. I know. Okay, now this story was sent- First of all, what I want to say is this story was sent in well over a year ago. And, and the reason I want to bring that up is because so many people ask, you know- how do you choose the stories? Or what? I'm just scrolling through yeah, literally yeah. thousands of emails. And um, I, I just kind of like scroll and I stop and I start looking through a section. So it's mm-hmm. it's not, there's no way to, you know, jump the line or get chosen. So, oh, you know, gotcha. for these stories, I just did a command F and looked for New Orleans to come up in stories, right? Cool. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So anyways, it can take a while for us to get to your story. So don't stop sending them in. Um, now, this story for me feels like it could happen to me. And and I mean that very truly because I'm so sensitive to other people's energies. Mm-hmm. And it's it's kind of a new thing for me even for me to even be comfortable acknowledging that. Um, I mean, you know how I am. You're forever calling me a sponge or a chameleon. Like I just absorb what's around me. Yeah. Like like if you're around somebody who has a very specific catchphrase or tick, mm-hmm. uh, if you hang around them enough, I'll find you kind of mimicking that possibly or, or slipping into their cadence a little bit. Yeah. I don't even mean to. Right. Right. It's like, I remember, or like if we go to the South, you know, it's like if we're in the South for very long, uh, you'll start saying y'all. I still say y'all. I picked up y'all. That's I don't think that's a good example oh, a good because example. I picked up y'all in Nashville like three years ago, and then I just never let it yeah, go. You've kept that one. Yeah, yeah, that one stuck. You know what I specifically love about y'all is that in 2020, when everyone identifies differently, mm-hmm. y'all feels like the safest, hmm. non-offensive way. Because I don't know if you identify male or female, but yeah. y'all is to me 
all encompassing. Okay. So I, I have consciously chosen that. Um, but anyways, as you, as you listen to this story, I, I think for me, what I'm going to ask of you, which I mm-hmm. don't generally ask much, is that you really hear what the author is saying because I think that you'll be able to hear my own voice in this story. Oh, okay. And, and for me, I want you to know what it's, it feels like to be me and that I'm not crazy. Like I'm not the only person who absorbs energy that way. I right. think, I think it's, you know, part of being an empath and I didn't even know that there was a name for it. And so it's, I think the story is going to get you. Okay. Okay. So the story begins. What up, Dan and Lindsay? Huge fan. I love that you added in Creeps and Peeper's personal stories. It's possibly my favorite part of the show oh, nice. as it reminds me that I'm not fucking crazy. Or maybe I am. Who knows? In June 2018, my best friend and I traveled to New Orleans for a vacation week. Both of us are into the supernatural stuff, so we wanted to check out as many haunted, creepy things in NOLA as possible. We found a haunted pub tour, which was going to be the perfect mix of getting drunk and creeped out. The tour starts at this voodoo spiritual temple, which is basically a townhouse with a gift shop and a bunch of altars and haunted ghost things. We get to go through the townhouse looking at each altar and each room. The woman who owns the place starts off the quote-unquote official tour by explaining spirits and that often they aren't something you see, but rather it's usually something you hear or feel, like someone brushing your hair Mm -hmm. or whispering in your ear or having an emotional or physical reaction. She told us when we went upstairs to check out the rooms and pay attention to how we felt in each one. In my head, I'm like, okay, lady, we'll see what you're talking about. My friend and I headed up some creepy ass stairs into this teeny tiny apartment, which opened up into the world's smallest living room. My friend and I decided to head into the kitchen first, which was to the right. Immediately when you enter the kitchen, there's a stove with an altar and a Mm. bunch of offerings on it. And to the right of that is a walkway with a refrigerator at the end. Then there's a narrow hallway to the left of the refrigerator, which leads into a real creepy bathroom. We take our time walking through the kitchen and down the hallway. I mean, it takes like 30 steps to get through the kitchen to the bathroom. As we are walking down the hallway, my face starts getting really hot, like really, really hot. We make it to the bathroom and I glance around and it's gross and I'm over it. My friend is checking out her hair in the old mirror and my heart starts beating faster and faster and faster. And I'm thinking, oh my God, am I having a panic attack? What the fuck? Pull it together, Anna. My heart eventually feels like it's going to jump out of my chest and I'm internally freaking out more and more. My mind is racing and my face and my hands are now growing hotter and hotter. I'm on the verge of hyperventilating. By this point, I'm convinced that I'm having some sort of claustrophobic attack Mm -hmm. due to the small space and the stuffy hot air. In a panic, I say to my friend, is it like really hot in here? And she replies, no, I'm fine. What's wrong with you? I responded, I don't know, but I'm freaking the fuck out. I got to get out of here. I turn around and speed walk back to the living room. And I kid you not, the second I stepped over the threshold into the living room, I was back to normal. My heart wasn't racing. My face wasn't on fire. My breathing was normal. It was as if nothing had ever happened. I'm like, what the actual fuck is going on with me? Am I going nuts? I eventually shrug it off to the fact that I'm just losing my shit and apparently I'm now claustrophobic. We check out one other room and then we head back downstairs where we started. The woman who owns the place asked us if we thought if anything had creeped us out. We try and play it cool and say, yeah, you know, it was creepy, but I kept my panic attack to myself. She proceeds to tell us the history of the apartment and that's when I was like, holy fucking shit, oh my God, get me out of here. The apartment was once inhabited by Zach Bowen and Addie Hall in 2006 during Hurricane Katrina. Long story short, the two used to be in a relationship and were some of the few who refused to evacuate when Hurricane Mm. Katrina hit. When things started to return to normal, it's alleged that Addie told their landlord that Zach was cheating on her and she was kicking him out. It's hard to say whether these accusations were from drunk delusions or the reality of the situation as they were both drinkers and drug abusers. My God. What was that? Oh, the light just went out. Our light just went out. That is creepy. (laughs) Why? Why? Why did that just happen? Oh, God. I don't like that. Okay. Okay. Oh, boy. Okay. Okay. (laughs) Okay. Keep going. Okay. 
Zach ended up strangling Addie to death in the bathtub before cutting her up into pieces. Wow. Her head was placed in a pot on the stove. Her feet were either in a pot with her hands or in the oven with her legs. Zach cooked what he managed to get on the on and in the oven. The remainder of her corpse went into the refrigerator in a large bag. Zach then committed suicide by jumping off the Omni Hotel yeah. Head first. He left a suicide confession note admitting what he had done to Addie. I'm hearing this fucking story and I'm like, oh my fucking God. First of all, gross. And second of all, what the fuck? Mm -hmm. The owner proceeds to tell us, quote, so some people have had some very strange feelings when they're looking at the apartment upstairs. Some women complain to me that their head, arms, and legs are burning hot, but their torsos are ice cold. I told her it was likely the spirit of Addie reaching out to let her know just how she had died. Also, many attractive women have complained of a male voice whispering in their ear or someone touching their hair. That's likely Zach flirting with them as he was apparently a ladies man when he was alive. What the fuck? I never really thought about how spirits or ghosts can sometimes be a feeling. I definitely had some interaction with Addie and it wasn't just a claustrophobic attack. Additionally, after we left, my friend said to me, you know what's so weird? I've had my shirt tucked in all day, but the minute I walked around that apartment, it was pulled untucked. Was Zach the ghost trying to get in my pants? Who knows? That place is creepy as fuck though, and I will never, ever go back. I'm sure I missed some pieces of the Zach and Addie story, but if you Google the Nola Cannibal, you'll get all of the details. Thanks for the, thanks for the read. Keep it creepy, Anna. Anna, yeah, I forgot about that story. But oh, I, you knew that story? Yeah, I, I totally forgot that was a thing. But I, I remember seeing that in the news. That wow. crazy cannibal. Yeah, like I mean, it was just it's such a yeah, uh, you know, grotesque story. Yeah, I, I did like, some. Oh yeah, yeah, I did not know that story. And generally speaking, I don't like research stories mm -hmm. after people send them in because. Either they're not a famous story yeah. or, you know, they don't have a connection that I can actually confirm. But since Anna gave us the scoop, I decided to check it out. And it was truly, truly, truly a devastating crime. I mean, just so – Zach was a veteran and he was suffering mm. from PTSD and he had been previously married and had kids and, like, left that life and came to New Orleans and met Addie. And she, I want to say, had been previously abused and she uh. was, you know, a bohemian artist. And and the two – so the two of them were very clearly suffering some sev from severe mental illness. And, I mean, I don't know. I'm not suggesting that I think either of them could have been saved or fixed or, like, whatever mm. word you want to use on that. But it's just – um. I don't know. It just goes back to the thing. Like, you know how much I believe in therapy mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. it just makes me so angry, especially as Zach being a veteran that the help wasn't there for him. I mean, I don't know. Maybe he never sought it out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, you can't help the unwilling, but I, I don't know. It just made me think like, I'm such an advocate for all kinds of therapy mm -hmm. and for self-help and for taking care of yourself that way. And I know that a lot of us don't want to like face our demons or we think, you know, oh, I don't have the time or I don't have the money. And it's, you know, there is actually always a solution because I know in my darkest times, not having the money to take care of myself was, you know, a huge concern. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there's therapists that work on sliding scales and all that. I don't know. It's just like a little PSA of it doesn't actually have to get. And free hotlines. There is there is some things. Some, things, some yeah. usually there is uh, services that are totally free. Yeah. So that's, that's my lecture. I just, you know, take yeah. care of yourself because it's so, it's such a fucking sad story. Mm-hmm. The whole thing about the feelings, uh, yeah, there, there is a whole like vein of stories along those lines where it's like, you mm -hmm. know, um, something very specific, uh, happened in this room, like, or somebody died in a very specific way. Uh, let's say hanging, for example. Yeah. And then, and then people go into the room and feel like, uh, their they throat get tight, right. that they can't breathe. That is such an unusual phenomena. Like, right. like, where does that come from? That the energy of how somebody died remains in a space mm -hmm. and affects. Uh, I mean, I always want. I, I again, like the skeptic in me is always like, did they know that before they went in there? But I, I, I can't imagine they always did. Well, in this There's situation, those, right, and, Anna and is not, saying she didn't right, know. And not in this one, yeah. And, and she was skeptical when she started, like, okay, whatever, right? But yeah. still felt it, yeah. And, and what a specific like thing because her hands and her face got really hot mm -hmm. and those were the body parts that were put and boiled on the stove oh or cooked in the oven. Right. Yeah, when I the apartment ahead. manager told her afterwards, right? Like some it's people It's the woman report, who owns the building. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, owns so if, the owner. Okay. If you go and google it, um some people think that 
the woman who owns the building, mm -hmm. she practiced voodoo. Ah. And they say like, well, maybe it was the energy of the building that, you know, got to Addie and Zach oh. because they lived somewhere else before during the storm. Mm -hmm. And then because of all of the tragedy of the storm, they just felt like they wanted a fresh start and they ended up moving there. Yeah. But I don't... Other people will say, but that's not what voodoo is. Like voodoo, sure. voodoo wouldn't cause you to do that. Um, I mean, there it's really sad. Again, he was suffering from severe mental illness with PTSD. I again I think that she was abused. I mean, yeah. it was just this really awful combination of things that happened. Right. And in, if if you Google it and you read some things, uh, the suicide note that he left is tragic because Obviously, he killed himself, and that is sad in itself, mm -hmm. but he confesses the murder and how he always knew he was a bad person, and it was so easy for him to kill her. Like, he just, Man. you know, yeah. maybe, uh, it, it was just really crazy. And then because he had disposed of the body the way in which he did, it was like two weeks before anybody found the dismembered body. It, it was only because of his suicide because people were asking where Addie was and he was saying that she went back to her family, I think like <sighs> North Carolina, South Carolina, but because he had like cooked it Jesus, and yeah. it, it just didn't smell. It right, wasn't that right. decomposition. Oh my God. So, I mean, God, yeah. Yeah, it just the whole fucking thing. And, and so what I was going to say about the like, oh, the feelings is, um, I sometimes I wonder when someone is brutally murdered, is do they hang around longer because they can't accept what happened to them, especially because it was at the hands of this person that she loved so much? Mm -hmm. Is she hanging around to try and figure out what, like, why did he do that to me? Right. There's that, there's all those uh, theories about like unfinished business or yes. like an especially traumatic kind of way to go, and the energy is more intense, and they think that that is then why it uh, remains in the area. It's, it's also weird. I know. It's also weird that like a- Just to speculation. Think to, yeah, to think that like a certain way you could die could allow your energy to remain. And mm -hmm. then I always wonder too, okay, let's say that's true. Does your consciousness remain with the energy? Uh, like, is the ghost actually oh. the person, or is it just an echo of the person? Like, like is the is the is the ghost just some kind of hollow entity that's like you know caught in this revolving door of the same kind of last moments that the person lived in? Yeah, you know, like being whatever dying over and over again, or being yeah. angry about dying over and over again. But is that per is that entity actually like? Would it have memories of the person's life? Would it really be you? Like if you uh, died in a capture. traumatic way, and then yeah. you're on the other side, do you have p quiet moments where you reflect on you know <laughs> what happened, what you had for lunch, you know, three years ago, or this person? Or, oh, I wonder what they're up to. Or are you just in this moment? Are you there's just a piece of you in this moment? Yeah, I think what you're proposing is: Does your consciousness live on? Mm -hmm. You know, like, is is it just a spirit that's reliving the same thing over and over? Or do they have, you know, conscious thoughts, perspective, yeah. right? And I mean, if you really want to get into it, that's kind of the debate with AI, right? I mean, right. like, what happens when you, they're not just a robot, right? So when it's not just a spirit, when they can have a sense of morality and they yeah. can reflect and they have a conscience, it's, mm -hmm. you know, that whole, that whole world of things is very it's interesting. Yeah, it really what is. What if, what if AI has really been invented by spirit scientists who developed a consciousness and then they're putting it into the AI and it really is going to be that the robots are taking over, but they're like robot ghosts. Oh, man. <laughs> Some weird, they're like teaming up <laughs> behind the scenes to kill all the humans, the robots and the ghosts. There's, oh, there's so many weird places we could we could, I know, we could, we could I know. this. <laughs> do you have some Annabelle shout outs that I, you'd like to do? I do, I do. I want to uh, thank the following Annabelles for supporting us on Patreon. Thank you to Stacy Judd, Canvas Pena, Julie McLaughlin, Corey Keck, Daniel Phillips, Thomas, no last name given, Kathy Heston, Ashley Starr, Kelsey Dye, Faith Sutton. <laughs> what is big deal 24? I think do you uh, want time to say suck reference. Yeah. What is big deal? There you go. <laughs> uh Brandy Holder, Diego Guerra, Eric Gallier, and Ashley Kine. I would like to thank the Annabelles, Jensen Hemming, Heather Seymour, Kinsley Mason, Taylor, who is the host of the Going Past the Veil podcast. I'm sorry, Going Past the Veil with Taylor podcast. Danny Hornberger, Andrew Quinn, Jamie Smith, Katrin, no last name. Wendy Gilliam, Brittany Joy, Emma Johnson, Logan Perez, Amy Town, 
Jamie E, and Jeff Willingham. And then, of course, Average Booby Shoutouts. Average Booby Shoutouts. Yes. And in full disclosure, I just have to say that we rearranged some episode order to put this episode Mm -hmm. because we record in advance. So I am hoping that I cut and pasted the right (laughs) Spoopy Shoutouts from this one to this one. So if I have given these in the wrong order, I'm really sorry. I just ask for a little grace and forgiveness there. But these shout outs are to Megan from Ryan. Happy 11th anniversary. To Kurt from Colton. I love you. To Lizette from Liesel, your daughter. Love you. To Eric and Deanne from Carol. So sorry for the loss of your dog. To Chanel from your mom, Lynn. Happy bleated birthday. To Todd from your wife, Crystal. Happy birthday. And she says, they'll never find you. <laughs> Which sounds like something I was idiot. I know, I love it. And to Carlo from Michelle, happy anniversary. And then I have two little special ones. I just wanted to say thanks to Joe Paisley, our awesome producer Mm -hmm. who put together this road kit and taught us how to use the equipment, was on FaceTime with us before we did this. Uh, Thanks, Joe, for helping us get this shit together. And then last night, we had this awesome dinner at N7. Uh, Sarah with an H. Sarah with an H. Thanks for being a fan. It was so (laughs) great to meet you last night. Uh, That's all for today. Uh, Thanks for joining us in New Orleans. Um, Hope we didn't leave... um, um, uh, anything we didn't want you to see laying around the room, but I, oh. I don't, I don't think so. No, I think I did a good job of yeah. cleaning up. <laughs> yeah. That 360 camera, I've never used one before. So pretty cool. Yeah. And uh, why that light go out? Well, they're, we're, we're really figuring this out. These lights, I, I'm guessing the, the batteries, I remember Logan, these, these are lights Logan had bought a while. Logan Keith. But he um, said that they should last for hours. Yeah, sometimes they do, and then sometimes they just go. Ah, oh, they're mysterious. Uh, uh, thanks, everybody, for cont- continuing to send in your personal tales of terror to my story at scaredtodeathpodcast.com. Uh, email us for everything else, info at scaredtodeathpodcast.com. Thanks to Logan Keith, who I just mentioned, uh, for um, doing the social media posts for badmagicmerch.com design. And producer Sophie, Ev- Sophie Evans, who we just had dinner with last night. At uh, N7. She met Sarah mm-hmm. with an H. Uh, thanks for help with story cura- curation. Thanks to Joe Paisley again for putting together this travel kit and production. Zach Cohen for custom sound bed creation. Thanks to Heather Rylander for organizing the My Story emails. Subscribe to Bad Magic Productions on YouTube. If you want to watch this episode, see how the 360 camera works. Uh, and of course, others. And hopefully it worked. And hopefully it worked. <laughs> <laughs> hopefully it's just not a still photo after all this. Uh, follow us on Facebook and Instagram if you want more content. At Scared to Death Podcasts. And that's where you see the pictures from the shows. And we have a private Facebook group, Creeps and Peepers that Liz Hernandez moderates. Thank you, Liz. Uh, If you don't want to hear more ads, if you want monthly bonus episodes and more, check out our Patreon and enjoy your nightmares, creeps and peepers. Hope you were scared to death. See you next time in New Orleans. If spirits threaten me in this place, fight water by water and fire by fire. Banish their souls into nothingness and remove their powers until the last trace. Let these evil beings flee through time and space. Evil may pass through, but has no home here within scared to death.